Have you ever been on a night hike before? When I was a teenager, my mom was wise and sent me to Outward Bound as I was unsure of myself and needed that extra boost. Outward Bound is kind of a wilderness school um, and there was a part of the wilderness school where we were invited to walk in the dark, in the woods, what felt like the middle of the night for a quarter of a mile. Now it felt like 10 miles, but it was long enough to really truly feel the darkness in the wilderness and short enough to know that you wouldn't lose your way. It was a perfect challenge. There's this moment when you're walking in the dark by yourself where the fear and the anxiety starts to creep all over your body. It tingles. You hear animals and you worry about animals of every kind, especially humans. You worry about losing your way. You worry about everything and anything that goes thump in the night even ghosts and goblins and creatures of your childhood. And then there's the moment, maybe it's just a moment, but it feels like an eternity where you just take a deep breath and you take a step forward. Your eyesight starts to adjust. You can see the path. You can hear the owls and the crickets. And before you know it, you're walking along your way and you see the beauty of the forest at night in a new light. Now, I found myself since that moment several times walking to and from at camp in the dark by myself. And I don't really enjoy night walks that way, but I do appreciate them and respect them. It was a moment of transformation for me it was a moment of working through my anxiety and fear and taking a step in the darkness. Truthfully, those dark moments, if you were to think more metaphorically, in my life are moments of transformation. Where you see, God does amazing things in the dark, and I truly believe it. Today's scripture is from Isaiah. It's the third section of Isaiah, and it was written, quote, unquote, for all those who mourn in Zion. You see, almost 600 years before Jesus was born, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of the Babylonian Empire, went after the territory where Jerusalem is and destroyed Solomon's temple. I mean, he raised the city of Jerusalem to the ground after years and years of fighting and besieging. And leaders and educated and anyone with sort of skill or leadership style was exiled from their homeland, sent to Babylon. You see, all those who conquer territory know the best thing to do is to get rid of those who know how to run things. So the people, the Jerusalem, um, the, the natives of Jerusalem, the, the Hebrew people were kept in the Babylonian empire as slaves for 50 years. And somewhere around the 50th year, the Persian king took control of the Babylon empire and allowed them to return to their homeland. And after that long journey, after that long journey where they thought, surely the temple would have been rebuilt, surely the homeland after 50 years would have raised from the ashes, they could see Jerusalem. And what they saw was the continued destruction of Jerusalem. All that was left was still ashes even 50 years later. Not much had left, happened. There was chaos and infighting from the people who were left behind. And this is where today's scripture is supposed to be sung and spoken of. This is when it was written for, what time it was written for. It was written for heartbreak and frustration. And yet the song is about joy. I will greatly rejoice 
in the Lord, my whole being shall exult in my God. For the, as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. Wow, what an incredible thing. You see, when I thought of that, and when I thought of today's scripture, I see a lot of parallels between then and now. Well, no, we're not returning to our homeland, but the wait for us is almost over, too. The end is in sight. We can see Jerusalem. The vaccine is now arriving at facilities, medical facilities, all over the United States tomorrow. Our eyes have adjusted and we still see the chaos that is still very present. We are still very sick. The infection rates are out of control. The hopes of that temple that we have in our heart that we can just swing back to the way it was is gone. We see the inadequacies of our health care, our government, to do something, anything for its sick people. Yet they sing God's praises of joy. And today we celebrate joy because transformation happens in the darkness. It happens here with me, with you. God changes lives in the darkness. I've been reading this book. Um, Actually, Reverend Laurie and I were talking about it last week, and I realized I have this wonderful book from Barbara Brown Taylor, Learning to Walk in the Dark, um, and then I actually never read it, and I just had it on my shelf. And the reason I never let, read it is because, oh, I don't want to talk and think about darkness. And I thought, actually, now is the time to think about darkness. She talks about darkness and how so many wonderful things happen in the darkness. She says, new, she says, hold on one second. Oh, I have learned things in the dark that I could have never learned in the light. Things that saved my life over and over again. So there's only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as light. Do we need this darkness as much as life? I don't know. I don't know, but what I do know is that incredible things do happen in the dark. Transformation does happen. She says, new life starts in the dark, whether a seed in the ground or a baby in the womb or Jesus in the cave and the tomb, it starts in the dark. Now she mentions a cave and I really had to think about that. I thought, well, is she talking about Jesus in the wilderness? And as you go on to read, she talks about the possibility of Jesus being born in a cave. And I thought, now, wait a minute, I've got to look that one up. Now, I've never been to the Holy Land. And if you were to go to the Holy Land, you will find the Grotto of the Nativity is an underground cave. That the space that they have deemed as the space of Jesus's birth, do we know for sure? I don't know. But it is a crypt. Justin Martyr from 150 years after Jesus had born talked a lot about that and how in the area lots of houses were built above crypts and that oftentimes they would use like um, the underground part as, as the stable, as the nativity per se, to keep livestock in there. It was a safe place for all sorts of housing and dwellings. That whole area is polka dotted with caves. And so it's quite possible that the house connected to the back of it was a stable in a cave. And that Jesus may have actually been born in a cave. In a way that makes sense just as a new seed put into the darkness of the ground or a baby being brought forth in a womb. Great and incredible things happen with God in the darkness. 
And so today, on this third Sunday of Advent, I invite you to open your heart to the darkness. I mean, I invite you to just be still of where we are. Just like me in the middle of my night walk, finding your way, listening to your heart and your anxieties, taking a deep breath, and begin to recognize God's work that is present with you right now in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of the ashes that is transforming your heart and our hearts to live a better life, to be a people that God wants us to be. In this third Sunday of Advent, may we lean into that transformation space so that we can be the hands and feet of God in this world. Amen.